Statewide broadcasts of Your Legislators are made possible by the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. From developing best practices that help farmers better protect our natural resources to the latest innovations in corn-based plastics, Minnesota corn farmers are proud to invest in third-party research, leading to a more sustainable future for our local communities. Additional support by Minnesota Farmers Union, standing for agriculture, working for farmers on the web at mfu.org. We welcome you to another session of Your Legislators, a roundtable discussion featuring state lawmakers answering your questions and discussing important issues affecting the citizens of Minnesota. Join the conversation online on Twitter and Facebook. Now here's your moderator for tonight's program, Barry Anderson. Good evening and welcome to this week's version of Your Legislators. I'm Barry Anderson, your host for this program, and we're delighted that you've joined us for an hour of conversation about the important public policy issues facing the people of the state of Minnesota. We have a distinguished panel of guests who will be helping unravel to help help to unravel the mysteries of St. Paul, and, and we'll get to those guests in just a minute. But I wanted to open the program this evening with uh, a moment of remembrance. Um, in the course of the last six or eight months or so, uh, we have lost three former state senators uh, who were also frequent guests on this program. Senator Jim Bickerman from the Tracy area, Senator Earl Renicky from Lesseur, and Senator John Bernhagen from the Hutchinson area. All three of these individuals, all three were farmers, all three served uh, in the Minnesota legislature for nearly a quarter century. All three were leaders in their community, and they were all three frequent guests on our program. For many years, the guests who, who are answering questions for you today um, were preceded by these three individuals who were often here to help us unravel those mysteries. Uh, in each case, I had the privilege of knowing all three of them. Just a quick word, Senator Vickerman um, uh, was a farmer by trade, uh, but was also very actively involved in uh, development of the ethanol industry and related uh, uh, specialties. Senator Vickerman uh, was one of the people that we often went to when, unfortunately, the House might be busy or the Senate might be busy, but we needed a guest. And he was always available. I had the privilege of getting to know Senator Renicky because he began his Senate career following the tragic death of Harold Pott, state senator uh, from Hutchinson, who was killed in a tragic uh, uh, motor vehicle accident in February of 1969. Uh, and he represented parts of McLeod County, where I lived and worked for many years. Uh, Senator Renicky, again a farmer, uh, graduate of the University of Minnesota, and actively involved in economic development in a variety of ways. And finally, a word about Senator John Bernhagen, who I knew very well. Senator Bernhagen represented uh, much, of, uh, much of McLeod County throughout his uh, nearly quarter century career in the legislature, previously represented the House, uh, represented the area in the House of Representatives, and was also uh, the first economic uh, development director for the city of Hutchinson, where I knew him during my tenure there as city attorney. Each of these three individuals provided tremendous service to their community and to their state. We are grateful for their services, services to the state and to the people who live here. And on behalf of this program, our guests this evening and uh, the greater audience throughout the state of Minnesota, we send our best wishes and thanks to the family members, Senator Vickerman, Senator Renicky and Senator Bernhagen. So let us move on to the business of the legislative session today. And we'll begin this program as we do each week by giving our guests an opportunity to introduce themselves and to tell our viewers a little bit about themselves, uh, where they're from, uh, the committees they serve on, uh, the day job if so inclined, uh, and other useful information. Let's begin with somebody who's been with us before, uh, and that would be Representative Joe McDonald. Representative McDonald, tell the viewers a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you, Judge. Thank you very much. And thank you for the honor of the past senators who passed away. I particularly uh, knew uh, Senator Renicky, a good friend of my father, K.J. McDonald, who served in the legislature from 1976 to 1990. And I believe uh, Senator Renicky was also our, uh, his, our Carver County senator for a while before redistricting. 
and they became very good friends. It's long everybody. enough to go at least through two and maybe three redistricting. So uh, yes. yeah, I think you're right. Yep. Yeah. So uh, many photos of, of him and my father. But anyway, my name is Joe McDonald. I'm from uh, the city of Delano, Minnesota. I'm now serving in my sixth term, so it's 11 years now. And uh, I got elected in the year uh, 2010 and served 11-12 as my first term. It's been very exciting to be able to be a part of uh, Wright County and representing the good people there. I, uh, by my real job, I usually say my real job, my full-time job as a photographer. My wife and I own McDonald's Photography Studio in Delano, which my father founded in 1956 in Watertown. So I kind of followed in my father's footsteps, photographer, mayor of Delano, state rep. My dad was a photographer, mayor of Watertown, state rep. So I'm carrying on the family tradition. And uh, currently I'm on the tax committee, just a small committee called Taxes and uh, Economic Development. I'm also on uh, Industrial Education, which is a new committee to help uh, bring the trades and skilled labor into schools and to introduce to our kids uh, other careers. And then what is my last one? Um, oh, labor and Industry and Veterans Affair Policy and Finance, just a great committee to be a part of as well. So a um, lot of good work at the legislature. It's an honor to be on your show again. Thank you for inviting me here. And just in case I don't get to have a chance to wish everyone a happy belated St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Representative McDonald would not miss that opportunity, uh, and candidly, neither would have your father. So, uh, so also joining us, for, but for the first time, uh, is Senator Jennifer McEwen from Duluth, who is uh, in her first term as a Minnesota State Senator. We were just visiting a little bit before the program began and about the learning curve and so forth. Senator McEwen, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to join all of you this evening to talk. Um, I am... Um, this is my first term. Uh, my name is Jen McEwen, and I am from Duluth. I grew up in Duluth, and um, I um, live there with my spouse and two kids. I have two kids that are in uh, middle school, one in middle school, one in high school. I am an attorney by trade. I started out my career working at Legal Aid, actually, um, down uh, in Arizona. We were in Arizona for a couple of years while my spouse was going to school down there. And then when we moved back home to Duluth, I worked as a public defender for uh, three years, and then um, more recently moved into representing disabled workers. So that was what I was was doing before I decided to run for the Senate. And so I'm I'm really thrilled to be here and thrilled to be joining all of you this evening to talk. Uh, and we're delighted to have you. Uh, and of course. Um the public defender system, this is an opportunity to put in a plug for the Minnesota public defender system, which is really one of the fine public defender operations in, in the United States. And uh, uh, it's a privilege to have the opportunity to work with uh, uh, those individuals. Uh, my background is with Southern Minnesota Regional Legal Services. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had the chance to be a volunteer. Um, the amount of volunteer work that lawyers put in uh, through not only through our regional legal services, but other services is not well understood by the public, but it is a great it is a great credit to the Minnesota Bar. So that's the sales pitch for the lawyers. Um, that'll be the last time we'll do that today. So let's move on uh, and also introduce to our viewers, uh, uh, Senator Jason Rarick. Senator Rarick, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Thank you for having me here. Uh, appreciate being asked back again. And uh, I'm Jason Rarick and I have grown up and currently still live in the Pine City area. Um, I currently live on the farm that my grandparents had. My son, I'm proud to say, is the fifth generation to have lived there. Uh, so our roots are deep there and I uh, have a lot of family and friends. So um, I really love that area of the state. I was in the Twin Cities for a little while for school uh, to become an electrician, which is my trade outside of the legislature, um, but was so happy to move back and get my grandparents' place. Um, I serve on uh, four different committees. I'm the chair of the Labor Committee. Uh, Vice Chair of Higher Ed, um, and I'm on the Jobs Committee and the Energy Committee. And with my background as an electrician and a, a union electrician, um, I have really been diving in deep to the jobs sector and the energy sector and, and trying to bring, you know, my background um, to the legislature with, in those two areas especially. So, you know, I, I served in the House for four years, and then now um, beginning my third year in the Senate and you know, we hear, you know, like Senator McEwen talking about the learning curve, you know, we're always learning. It's, uh, <laughs> I don't think you ever really know everything about this place. So, uh, you know, it's an honor to be here. And, and, you know, I just hope I, hope I can keep doing a good job and always appreciate the, the fact that I was chosen to represent the people. 
And finally, um, Representative Todd Lippert from Northfield. Representative Lippert uh, is uh, serving in his first term in the legislature. Uh, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself, Representative Lippert. Uh, thank you, and it's uh, great to be with you. Um, I'm actually in my second term in the legislature, and I represent the Northfield, Dundas, Lonsdale, Montgomery area, about an hour south of the city. I'm a pastor uh, by training. I've been an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ since 2003. I grew up in a small town of 700 people, and I've served churches in Wisconsin in the heart of dairy country. And then I was a senior minister at First United Church of Christ from 2012 until uh, just last year, about this time. Uh, after being elected, I decided to step away from that position, um, was into um, more than full-time jobs um, and, and wanted to give more time to this political work. So I, I serve on the Agriculture Committee, the Environment Committee, the Climate and Energy Committee, and also the Behavioral Health uh, and uh, uh, Policy Committee. I care deeply about agriculture and the health of small communities and also about caregiving issues. So uh, one issue I'm working on is uh, making sure that we're paying personal care assistance, a living wage, uh, as well as comprehensive soil health uh, legislation. So uh, I'm really glad to be here tonight. Uh, all I will say about the um, privilege of pastors serving smaller communities, um, I have some friends who serve in that capacity for two point parishes. And um, the way they explain it is each parish gets 75% of your time. So uh, yeah, I've served in a two point parish myself and that's not uh, far from the truth. <laughs> well, so let's let's start with you, Representative Lippert, and let's talk about one of the issues because we do have uh, we, we have had some questions from viewers um, uh, in past weeks about this. So this is probably as good a place to start as any. The issue that, that you highlighted there, um, uh, payment of wages uh, in uh, for people providing uh, care services. So uh, explain the issue to uh, to our viewers and we'll go around our virtual table. Sure. So I care deeply about caregiving issues across the age spectrum. I just really think that care needs, it's central to who we are as human beings and it needs to be thought of as central to our economy too. Um, one slice of that is um, the work of personal care assistance. So they provide care to older adults and people with disabilities in the home. And their average wage is like $12.38 an hour. Um, so it's, it's low. And that means there's high turnover um, in that workforce and people with disabilities and older adults are having trouble finding the care they need. This was a problem before COVID. It's been an even more serious problem now. And for um, many people with disabilities, this isn't just about living with dignity. It can be a matter of life and death. So uh, we have a, I have a bill that would provide reform to the rate framework as a whole. Uh, we need a different framework uh, for state reimbursement for PCA agencies so that they can provide a living wage to PCAs. And uh, we're really excited about this legislation. We feel like there's momentum for it this year. It's definitely a priority of mine. Um, we need to make sure that we're uh, valuing older adults and people with disabilities. And to do that, we have to pay their caregivers. Uh, this will benefit about 100,000 Minnesotans. Uh, there are roughly 40, uh, 45,000 Minnesotans that, uh, that depend on PCA services and 55,000 PCAs. 82% of those PCAs are women and uh, over 60% are people of color. So this is a key equity issue for our state too. Senator Rarick, your thoughts on this question? Yeah, you know, this is a subject that's been uh, here in the legislature since I got here. And, you know, I, I've spoken with a number of folks and it is the, the I think the saddest part uh, was mentioned, the turnover and, you know, so many of uh, the people who rely on the, the PCAs to take care of them, about the time they get used to someone being in their home with them and then the turnover happens and now someone new comes in. And so we absolutely have to figure out how we can uh, get them the pay that they deserve when they're taking care of our loved ones. Um, you know, too many times I've seen it just fall through the cracks at the end. Everybody talks, everybody agrees we need to do it. We do need to come together on this one and agree this has got to be one of our top priorities and, and not let it slip to the side. Senator McEwen? I couldn't agree more. I'm, I'm so glad to hear about this legislation. I was just speaking with some constituents up in Duluth about this very issue just a couple of days ago. And um, you know, I think it does go to a couple of different larger issues that we deal with, which is the equity piece that Representative Lippert was talking about. This is traditionally 
women's work. This is traditionally work that previously went unpaid and now just, you know, even years later is lagging behind um, and being viewed in a sort of second class type of employment. And it shouldn't be, it's just vital. It's really the salt of the earth work that caring for other people, caring for um, elderly, caring for people with, who are living with disabilities. Um, and it's just vital. And it also speaks to um, one of the big issues that I am very passionate about. And I think probably all the people who are joining us tonight are as well is the wealth inequality that we've seen grow in our country over the last decades, um, really since um, the eighties, especially where we have so much of the wealth that is generated um, through labor in our country siphoned up to the tippy tippy top, the top earners, top individuals and the wealthiest corporations while the vast majority of people are really struggling to get by with just the basics. We know our minimum wage hasn't kept up. You know, we know that most Americans couldn't afford an unforeseen $400 bill for something like a car repair or something like that. We just don't have enough saved. We don't have, we're not making enough money. Um, so I'm so glad that this work is being done. Um, this is a crucial piece. And, and I'm glad to hear also that there's the sentiment and the hope that we could actually get this done this year because we really do need to do it. Uh, Representative McDonald. On the issue of the PCAs, yes, uh, very important work. And uh, since my tenure has been here, it's always been a, a topic. We have made some progress over the years uh, coming together. This is one of those issues that Republicans and Democrats work together on and care deeply about. Much of the legisla legislation that I've had in the 10 years had to do with the disability community, providing funds for various group homes and organizations that help and work with the disabled community. So a very important issue and we have made some progress. We need to do better, certainly. Um, there's no reason why in our state of Minnesota that our personal care tenants make less than someone that works at a Home Depot or Menards. Uh, they're doing God's work and the work that the people of Minnesota want their tax dollars to spend to help those who are in need. So uh, it's an issue that we'll continue to work on and, and get better at. So uh, we'll have an opportunity to come back to this, I'm sure, perhaps this, perhaps today, but if not today, in the weeks ahead. But let's move on to another question um, uh, that comes to us via Twitter of all places. Uh, what does the panel think about the proposed constitutional amendment backed by uh, Federal Reserve President, local Federal Reserve President, Neil Kashkari, uh, and uh, my former colleague on the Minnesota Supreme Court, retired Justice Alan Page, pertaining to an adequate education? Um, let's start with you, Senator McEwen. Um, what's your view on that amendment? And uh, we'll go around the table. You know, I, I, I don't know enough about the amendment. I really should, should study up a little bit more on it. But, um, you know, I think that one of the, what, it's, what the amendment is trying to address, which is equity within our schools, is crucial and very, very important. Um, I think that I have heard some concerns um, from teachers and from educators throughout the state in regard to um, the fear that there might be some language in that amendment that would facilitate um, undermining our public school system. And, and that concerns me. So I don't, like I said, I, I am open to learning more about it and it's not something that I've studied up a lot on, um, but, um, but that, that, that's what I know about it. I know that the intent is good and, but perhaps, um, there are ways there's perhaps there's a compromise there. Maybe there's a language change that could be made with the amendment itself, or perhaps um, there's other ways that we can advance the, the equity. As we know in Minnesota, um, Minnesota is a really good place to live, to work, to be educated if you were a, a white person, but if you are a person of color, um, it's um, down there with Mississippi, um, which is our shame. Like we, we, sh we need to do better than that. So I applaud the efforts that I think are behind this. I don't know if it's the right vehicle or, or not, but um, I applaud that, those efforts. Uh, Representative McDonald, what are your thoughts about the proposed constitutional amendment dealing with uh, adequacy in education? I, I was hoping you'd call on someone else because I was going to bring up the uh, wording of the uh, constitutional amendment uh, bill, but <laughs> that's right. Well, uh, consequently, I have received many emails from my constituents here in Wright County, very concerned with it. Uh, I don't know if they're uh, 
if they're not understanding completely the language or maybe the, leg the language is not being very clear. But I have many folks that are homeschoolers and the kids that are in private school that believe that this language very much will hinder those who want to teach uh, those who are homeschooled and not give them the ability or the same footing equally as those in a public school. So uh, I am very cautious of uh, jumping onto that until I can fully understand the motive of it. And well, the motive, of course, is a good education to our, for our school kids. That's the true in all respects. But I need to do uh, a little more research exactly because every word makes a difference. You know, there's shall and to and just. Every word makes a big difference in law. And so I have many constituents that are very concerned about this issue and changing the wording on this constitutional amendment. So uh, it's something that we should probably be a little bit more delicate, uh, delicate and make sure that all parties are interested and know the issue well and know that it's not going to harm our homeschoolers or our charter or private schools. Uh, Resident Lippert, your thoughts? Uh, so my thoughts are very much uh, the same as Senator McEwen's. Um, I think there's no doubt that we have to be addressing racial equity in our schools. Um, we, you know, have such deep uh, achievement gaps by race and, and we have to turn that around. I think there's deep, deep respect uh, for Justice Page and uh, the work that he's done for racial equity and his, his efforts behind the amendment, as well as um, uh, Mr. Kashkari too. There is, there is concern though, uh, that uh, this amendment might have some unintended consequences that would be, um, that would be hard for our public school system. And so uh, making sure that we are addressing equity while strengthening uh, our public schools that can deliver for all students, regardless of race and regardless of geography from border to border is, um, is really critical. So uh, this conversation um, is important, it's nuanced, and it'll be continuing at the Capitol. Senator Rear, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I echo the sentiments. You know, I've, I've heard uh, some concerns about the language and, but I do believe it has uh, brought forth discussion here at the Capitol that we've needed. And I think it's spurred a couple of uh, bills that we have seen this year um, in regards to uh, trying to incentivize teachers of color and then especially teachers of color who are men um, because there are so few of them in our schools. And so if, if we can be doing things like that, you know, maybe a constitutional amendment isn't needed, but it will we'll maybe have done its job of raising the awareness and, and getting the legislature to act in other ways uh, to help solve a problem. All right. Well, we'll have an opportunity to be talking about that issue as well as the weeks unfold. We have, a, we have another viewer who wants to know whether or not um, the uh, legislature will be passing any laws uh, dealing with police reform issues. And are there any specific reform issues that the uh, members of the panel think uh, should be considered? So uh, let's start with you, Representative Lippert. What's your thoughts on that? I think um, police reform is definitely just a critical, critical conversation and a deep conversation within uh, within the House DFL caucus. Um, you know, I think we had after uh, the death of George Floyd over the summer, we had comprehensive police reform, accountability reform that was put in place on a bipartisan measure, and uh, uh, we were clear that this was this was just a start. And so I think as we move, um, you know, as we move through this session, one. You know, one conversation I've had with local law enforcement has, has been related to um, training, related to um, helping officers with people who are in mental health crisis and providing more support for uh, police officers and law enforcement related to mental health, trying to take some pieces off their plate. The local law enforcement I've talked to are very open to that, very interested in that, and think that we can provide some support there and help deliver key safety services to our community um, in some different ways that really get at the heart of what people are dealing with. Um, and then related to that, you know, what we're really talking about in so many ways is the impact of poverty on communities. And so if we can be addressing that um, by making some deep investments in our state, it's going to be um, lightning load for uh, police officers as well as we create healthier communities um, across the board. Representative McDonald, your thoughts on the police reform question? Thoughts are this, that we need reforms in many areas in our life. Police reform, family reform, legislative reform. We are not a perfect people. There are mistakes made. 
So we need to definitely look at the reforms of the police. Defunding them is certainly not going to be the answer. That's completely the wrong way to go. So I know that there are some folks in our state that uh, have been uh, getting on that bandwagon to defund the police. That is a horrible idea. And unfortunately, in some of these neighborhoods, we need family reform. Uh, children need their parents. They need a father and they need a mother. Boys need their dad. We need to reform the family as well and get back to the roots of teaching you know, great things of moral values, good respect for people, uh, good education. So it's not just about police reform. It's in my opinion, and the people that I hear in my district, it's a broader issue of securing the family and making sure that children have good parents to raise them. If it's a single parent or not, good parents to teach them good values and good principles. And we need good education to do that as well. We are in the state of Minnesota, we have the biggest, widest gap in our students of color and white. And we definitely need to fix that. And the answer is, in my opinion, and many vouchers, let kids get out of a school district that is failing. Let them, let those parents be able to take their kids out of a school that perhaps they're not doing well and bring them into pay perhaps a, another school, charter school or a private school. That is an answer to reforms as well. So uh, it's a big issue. Uh, I think the police departments are doing what they can in uh, and the legislature to offer those reforms, but it doesn't just, it starts with the family. Senator McEwen, your thoughts, police reform. Police reform, um, you know, I, I think that what we went through and what we are still going through is a reckoning of racial justice throughout the country and that, that we in Minnesota were the epicenter of that reckoning that, that happened with the murder of George Floyd. Um, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> and, and, you know, I really applaud uh, Representative Lippert's, Lippert's comments around the economic piece of all of that. I think that that is, is spot on. A lot of these issues go back to not funding our schools properly. They go to the wealth inequality that I was talking about earlier. Um, they go to not having a high enough minimum wage, not having an adequate safety net. There's so many pieces economically that are missing that we've really let fall. We've fallen behind the rest of the world in so many areas economically um, and haven't provided for, for one another. But um, specifically to police reform, it is, as, as Representative Lippert noted, the reforms that took place last year were something. Um, they were bar bipartisan, and it was good that there was one. There were some pieces that were that were moved, but it, there was uh, promises made to the public that this was just a start. This was just the beginning. That there would be more coming. And so I, I think that if if we don't <laughs> if we don't pass a meaningful uh, criminal justice reform. The people of Minnesota are watching. The people uh, in the United States are watching us too to see how we handle this. It was sort of um, disgraceful that we couldn't come up with a more comprehensive reform package, in my opinion, after we were the, at the epicenter of that reckoning that we went through, particularly the intensity of it last summer that resonated around the world. Um, that we weren't able to push forward with some more meaning, meaningful reforms was very disappointing. Um, and, and I think, you know, when we're talking about public safety, we, the, the movement to think about public safety in a more comprehensive way, where we are meeting the challenges that people are dealing with, the reason they call 911 in the first place, with the appropriate resources, is really what we need to be looking at. We, we can't be piling all of these uh, responsibility for dealing with people in mental health crisis, people dealing with different economic issues, all on the police force of, of a city. And I think there's also a dynamic here that we haven't talked about yet, which is a relationship that a police department has perhaps in a smaller town might be very different and look very different than the relationship that, for example, the Minneapolis Police Department has with the people of Minneapolis. I know that when I was going to law school in Minneapolis, it was quite shocking to me to see in the neighborhoods where we were living, 
there was an ethos of don't call the police unless it is just absolutely life or death because people were scared of them. They viewed them as a sort of occupying force in the city, that they were violent, that they were dangerous. So, um, and that was not the experience that I had had with the police force coming from where I um, was living in Duluth. Although some people in Duluth have had that experience with our police. But I, I do think that there's just a lot of different dynamics at work here. And we absolutely need to move forward in, in so many ways to think about public safety in a more holistic way. Senator Rarick, your thoughts? Yeah, you know, thank you. Um, you know, this has uh, been brought to the forefront and are there reforms that are needed? Uh, sure. Uh, I think one of the things that needs to be remembered uh, if we're going to do reforms, the police associations need to be involved in those discussions. I think anyone, no matter what group you're in, if there are gonna be reforms to your um, career or your job sector, you're going to want to have a voice in that. And, and the other thing that we have to remember, you know, this is coming up because of a, there are a few bad police officers. And you know what, there are a few bad electricians out there and there are a few bad teachers out there. There are a few bad, you know, you name the profession. So I think what we can't lose sight of the fact that there are a lot of good police officers out there and they are doing initiatives to reach out and gain that trust of their communities. And those are the things we need to really focus on so that people within the community are encouraging their youth to become the police officers for that area in the future. Um, it is that, you know, it was brought up, you know, the small towns, uh, part of the reason that is, that dynamic is there is those police officers likely either grew up there or now they've moved there and they've gotten to know the people. And so you have that relationship and that's what's so important, no matter what we're talking about. So I think part of that reform has to be around building the relationships and that's a two way street, um, I, you know, people have to be willing to say there are good police officers and we have to put our trust in them and we have to reach out to them and start building that relationship. Then we will see true reform happen. Judge, if I can respond to that. Fire away. Uh, in regards to the police, when that was happening down in the third precinct, I had a good friend from uh, this town of Delano that works down there as one of the sergeants and uh, she was saying, stated that they have some great relationship with the business community and the neighborhoods in uh, that area, in the third precinct, and good relationship that they work hard, good friendships on both sides, from the police, the residents, and the businesses. So uh, Senator Rurich's right, uh, the conversation should be not there are many good police. Of course, there's a many, many, 99.9% .9 are really good. There are a few bad actors, and we will root them out, and they must be eliminated. But uh, by no means, uh, in the sergeant that I spoke to, people didn't fear the police, like Senator McEwen said, and maybe there's, that's uh, the situ situation, but so too is the fact that many good relationships and respect and, and uh, uh, companionship between the police and the residents in that district. So, um, and then I just have a question for Senator McEwen, as far as education, in the 11 years I've been there, we've always funded education, we've always added more money. That's the biggest pot in the pie of funding for our uh, the state of Minnesota out of the 48 billion we spend it most half of it goes to the education. In the Twin Cities area, they're getting 14 to 25,000 per pupil. And still, many are failing. So Sen Senator McEwen, how much is enough? In the city of Delano or in the Wright County and probably Pine County as well, and maybe Representative Lippert's uh, county, our pupils are getting eight to, you know, on the average, eight to 9,000 per pupil. And, uh, and certainly we don't have the problem that the Twin Cities have, but how much is enough, Senator McEwen? So with that thought in mind, we actually have a viewer who wanted to talk about education, K-12, pre-K. So let's talk about that. Uh, uh, Representative McDonald has kicked it off and Senator McEwen, the floor, floor is yours. Let's talk about uh, educational priorities and disparities and what do you see happening in that area? Well, I, you know, I, I take issue with that. We've never actually fully funded education in our state. And we need to look at the formula that we use to to assess, you know, like, our, and, and we also looked at, have to look at the way that we're funding um, education with property taxes. So, so we need to raise revenues. I mean, we have to do that. 
we're, we're going to have to raise revenues. We're going to have to increase the spending on education. And, um, you know, I'm not on the education committee. I forgot to, I neglected to say at the beginning that my committees are labor and industry. I'm the DFL lead on that committee. I'm on transportation and I'm on legacy environment. So this is not my wheelhouse in terms of the numbers themselves. But I do come from a family of public school teachers. My dad was a public school teacher, social studies. My spouse is a high school um, um, social studies teacher as well, teaches economics. And, and my grandmother taught art in the public school. There were like a lot of public school teachers in my family. And um, so I, I trust and I know that they, as well as the public servants who are serving on the school boards and in the administration throughout Minnesota, aren't just taking this money and dumping it, right? I mean, they are strapped. They need more resources. They need more money. So um, this is just symptomatic, again, of so many different issues that we've been looking at for years where we just have not had the political resolve to raise revenue and to tax people fairly. So it, we're long past time to do that. It, we have been on a this trickle-down myth. Um, we've been riding that wave for decades now, and it has not served us well as a society. It's created great instability. It's created great wealth inequality. Our systems, whether it's education or the social safety net or our healthcare system, are all kind of in shambles here. And now we have actually this amazing opportunity coming out of the pandemic where we're going to be able to remake things in a way that we would like to see them. So I, I do favor raising revenues. I trust our teachers. I trust the administrations that they're doing the best job they can with what they have. And they are telling us that we have never fully funded public education and I trust them. I believe that we have never fully funded public education to the extent that we need to. We should have world-class public education in Minnesota. World-class, we should be at the tip top. And I know that when I was coming up, in the 1980s, we were very proud of our public school system in Duluth. You know, we would look at our graduation rates, look at the quality of the education, the type of classes we could have, and we were very proud of that. But now things have fallen to an extent where there's less classes offered, the class sizes are really high. And, and I know that the people who are involved are all doing the best they can with what they have. So I do believe that we need revenues. And just very quickly, I know that I've been going on, but I, I really, to this bad apples argument, we all know this is part of the reckoning, right? This is part of the reckoning with our police department, the recognition that it is not just a few bad apples, that there is systematic injustices, systematic racism built into practices within the way that law enforcement deals with the public from first interaction, then all the way up through the first appearance at court, the way that the trials are conducted, the way that the outcomes are at the very end of the day. So I remember when the precinct was burnt down, the night that it was burnt down, my spouse and I were watching on, watching all of this go down online, live. And I remember seeing police officers on the roof of that precinct before it was burning and they were shooting people with rubber bullets. They were shooting out canisters into crowds. It was appalling to see. We just heard that three reporters lost their eyes from projectiles that the police shot at people. So this is not just a problem of, you know, a few bad apples running amok here and there and going too far and not following their training. The, the, the problems run deeper than that. And there are really talented people working on this. And I think we have to follow their lead on what, how we're going to solve those problems. Senator Rarick, let's talk about education. Um, what do you, um, uh, K through 12, pre-K through 12, we now see, what do you see coming out of this session? What's your uh, view on the funding issues? Well, I think, uh, you know, I, I would disagree that, uh, you know, money is just increasing spending is not the answer. Um, Representative McDonald brought it up. We have some school districts receive a lot of money per student, others not near as much. And yet it's, that isn't reflective of where the better results are from. And I, you know, it was touched on earlier and I do believe is this is a, the families that get involved with their students and help them and that help them believe that their education is important. That is what's critical. 
you know, I'm, if, a, if a teacher is in a classroom, that teacher could be the best teacher in the world and have all the support behind them. But if the students, when they leave that classroom, have no support, that teacher will not be able to be successful with those students. So we have to stress to families how important the education is for their children and have them get involved and help support them. That is what's going to actually elevate them to that level. And when they have hope and believe that an education can bring them up, you know, I look at it, my background in the trades, and I saw so many people, my father's generation that came from the family farms, they had, you know, nothing. They didn't know it, but they had nothing. And they went and they became the plumbers and the carpenters and the people who worked in uh, manufacturing, and they built the middle class. And that, that can happen again. And it just, you have to believe that you have an opportunity. And I think that's what I've been trying to get to so many of our inner cities. I remember hearing from some FFA uh, folks from Humboldt High School of all places. We couldn't believe when they came into Ag Committee and we thought Humboldt High School, there aren't farmers there, but they're like, no, they had a industrial arts program. And I, I will never forget the two boys that uh, spoke to us that said, you know, when I sit in my, uh, English class, I think, when am I ever going to use this in my life? Or when they sat in their history class, they, they didn't understand when they were going to use that, what ben how that benefited them. When they got into that industrial arts class, they saw a hope for a future. And that's what we need to be building into our students. Because if they don't have a hope for the future, I don't care who's in front of them. I don't care how much uh, money we pour into the system, they are not going to succeed. So that is where our focus really needs to be. This emphasis on just taxing the people more. We're already a high tax state. Um, if we would have passed uh, the bill that came through, the, the amendment that came through the Senate to create the fifth tier uh, income tax in this state, we'd have become either the first or second highest tax state in the whole nation. So this isn't about raising revenue. This is about building that family support and building hope for our students. Education, Representative Lippert, your thoughts on that? Yeah, so our schools, our school funding hasn't kept up with inflation since the early 2000s. If we were funding our schools appropriately and properly, our school districts across Minnesota wouldn't be going to the community over and over again for levies to meet basic needs. I'm not even talking about bonding issues for trying to to expand a school building or deal with a dilapidated school building. I'm just talking about trying to pay teachers so that they don't have to cut their staff. But that's what's happening with our school districts across the state. Because of steadily low, this low funding, this attrition of funding, and also the challenge of the special education cross subsidy, the federal government not fulfilling its promise to fund that like it should. And both of those pressures are just weighing on our districts. And uh, I mean, we passed a significant increase this last biennium, but it still didn't keep up with inflation. And I, you know, I think we are living in a time of, ex of accelerating inequality. It's inequality is accelerated even through the pandemic, even more. And to say that we can't ask those who are uh, earning a million dollars in Minnesota or more, $20,000 a week to pay a little bit more into our state in taxes so that we can help students in our public schools who are falling further and further behind through the pandemic catch up and help students of color or students who grow, are growing up in small rural communities have an excellent education. I just don't think that is fair at all. I don't think that's a Minnesota that um, that is true to our values. I don't think that's a Minnesota where we're saying, you know, we need one another and we care about one another. I think a strong public school system has the ability to neutralize the impact of poverty and that we can invest in every student through public, strong public schools. And I, I'm someone who grew up in a town of 700 people. Uh, I went to, a, I had a graduating class of 67. Um, so I went to a small school. My, my dad was my choir director at my school. Um, but I have concerns that um, students in small rural districts now, property tax poor districts, um, aren't receiving the same opportunities that I did. And the challenges are the same in 
uh, property tax poor or, or more impoverished communities in cities too. We need to find ways to get funding to our schools. And as we do, we will see better results. Are there issues relative, I'm gonna ask this to you, Representative Lippert, because you, you raised the, the point here about the spending issues. Are there, are there issues with the priorities in terms of the way we spend money in the public school system? In other words, <clears throat> are there efficiencies to be gained by uh, perhaps giving more local control or re reducing um, obligations on districts to, um, to uh, spend money in certain ways? So I think local control is very important and very valuable. And uh, you'll hear from school leaders regularly, they will, they will have concerns about uh, you know, various mandated policies that will come through the state and, and wanting, you know, wanting more flexibility. Um, I, think, you know, I think it's always important to be thinking about um, you know, how can we be as wise as we can possibly be with, with tax dollars? How are we wise towards with tax dollars? And um, we can't get lost in that conversation and um, ignore the bigger picture that we, we just steadily haven't been providing the same sort of funding for schools um, as we did before, um, you know, before 2000. And that we've, you know, we also have an issue with students carrying more concerns and burdens with them, a lack of mental health support staff. We have one of the lowest rates um, in the nation for um, support staff uh, as we compare ourselves to other states. So um, that's important, but I think there's a bigger conversation, uh, which is just general funding for schools. We're probably not gonna resolve this question tonight, but um, uh, we've certainly introduced the topic and there'll be more conversation in the weeks ahead. Let me turn to you, Senator Rarick, because we have a question from a viewer in New London who um, <clears throat> it's touching on uh, an area that uh, you, uh, uh, you let us know earlier, you have a little expertise in. This viewer wants to talk about electric vehicles. Um, electricians know something about that, right? So we'll, uh, go in that, we'll go to you first. And uh, this viewer is concerned from New London is wondering about uh, you know, where and how we're going to be able to plug vehicles in, our government building schools, courthouses going to have availability. Um, you know, I think there's a larger question here uh, about electric vehicles and, and, uh, and the question about electrification of uh, society, so to speak. But let's, let's start with that question. This viewer is concerned about access to um, electric uh, charging facilities. Is the legislature going to address that issue? And then more globally, um, what do you see the legislature doing uh, in the area of electrification vehicles and otherwise? The floor is yours to start with. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, I, I know far more about the infrastructure to charge the vehicles than the vehicles themselves. So, um, but that is, you know, kind of that, to me, the, a couple of big pieces as we move forward um, in this kind of this energy revolution that we're going through right now. And, um, you know, I, I like to talk about, you know, our energy future needs to be cleaner, cheaper, and reliable. It has to be all three together. And, Electric cars are going to play a part of that, um, you know, that storage piece. I, I think for me, if we're going to move forward with the renewables like solar and wind and, and whatever other uh, technology is coming down the road that we don't even know about yet, that storage piece is the key to make that happen to keep our system reliable. And I believe electric vehicles can be part of that because of the storage, you know, is there. But, you know, the infrastructure is going to be key. I think that keeps a number of people uh, right now from looking into that market because you don't want to end up uh, on a trip somewhere and now you're, you're parked for uh, four hours charging your vehicle because they didn't have that rapid charging station available. And so, you know, technology to me is what's going to drive the future. And we're, we're going to see these electric vehicles extend their range. We're going to see a, a, a wide variety. I think hydrogen is going to play a, a big role in uh, where we go with storage and potentially uh, replace even the electric vehicle and with hydrogen uh, powered vehicles. And, you know, it, it is a, a very interesting uh, piece to be in with the energy um, committee 
And, you know, there are, we are looking at things to incentivize putting in uh, these charging stations, um, helping, uh, whether it's through the RDA, giving grants to help uh, promote that. Um, these are all things that are, are good. Um, but yet I, I want technology to drive it, not a, a government mandate. Uh, you know, we all, uh, I, I know a number of people who have electric vehicles and, and they love them, uh, but they don't pull a boat, they don't, uh, they don't do construction work. Um, you know, I, a, an electric vehicle for me right now would not work. I, I end up all over the place with work. I carry large loads. You know, maybe someday that technology is going to be here and the gas engine will go away. Um, but I don't see that happening for uh, quite some period of time that, you know, I think, especially in rural Minnesota, that, that there is a worry about that, that when we talk about it and, and, and they, they don't see the affordability and they don't see the reliability uh, there yet. But I do believe technology at some point is going to get us there. Senator McEwen, electric vehicles, what do you think? I support them 100%. I support the clean card standards. We need to pass them. It's the least that we can do. I mean, it, and the bigger elephant in the room is that we are um, standing on the cliff of the climate crisis right now. We are at a moment in time right here where we're making decisions and we have the luxury of being able to make these decisions to smoothly, relatively smoothly make this transition. And I, I know that in committee, I heard testimony around the clean car rules um, from industry asking for this. They're asking, please, um, please pass these clean car rules so that we can compete, so that Minnesota's not gonna be left behind. You know, government all the time does things to encourage different parts of industry or to discourage other things. This is one of those pieces that, that we should have done actually a long time ago. We're kind of late here, um, but, but absolutely. We need the infrastructure. We need to encourage um, um, the, those sales. We need to encourage uh, and make sure that dealers are bringing those cars in so that, that Minnesotans have choice. This is really about economic choice so that people can make those choices. And um, you know, I think it was GM just announced that, what is it, by 20? 30, it's very soon. They're going to be have an entire electric vehicle fleet. They're not. They're going to stop selling gas vehicles. So, um, and an other another car company was quick to follow suit. So we're here. We're moving. Things are going to be moving very, very quickly in this transition to the clean energy economy. And so this is this is again the least that we can do. We should have done it years ago. President McDonald, your thoughts: electric vehicles, charging stations, etc. I liked what uh, Senator Rarick said regarding, I probably would have said the same thing, uh, although electric cars, the batteries have to come from somewhere, right? We have to pull the nickel and the precious metals out of somewhere. So it's not completely clean. We need some energy to produce them and to make them and to give the batteries to them. But if I may judge, I just want to quickly respond uh, since I started with education, but I'd like to uh, end with it to have an opportunity to respond to what Senator Lippert and uh, Senator, Representative Lippert, sorry, Senator, or, uh, and Senator McEwen, say regarding education and funding. Uh, and I'll just give you a scenario of two schools in Northeast Minneapolis. One is Ascension Catholic School and one is the Nellie Stone Johnson School, public school. And a good friend of mine, Father O'Connell, uh, got me uh, interested in this uh, when I started the legislature. So uh, Ascension Catholic School, the same demographics that go to the uh, Nellie Stone Johnson and Ascension School, same students of color, same free and reduced lunches, same demographics. The students at Ascension School are three times uh, in their education, three times better in their reading, in their writing, in their science, and two times better in math than the students at uh, Nellie Stone Johnson. They do it for $10,000 approximately per pupil. The graduation rate is high percentage, up in the uh, uh, 90s, I believe. Whereas Nellie Stone Johnson, the public school, it's fourteen to twenty-four thousand dollars per pupil. Mm -hmm. This was about four years ago when I get my numbers here, so it's probably extended. And their numbers are uh, the graduation rates are failing. Uh, they have a low, low percentage of graduating rates, and they uh, they spend the most. Same number of students. Same Rep number of students. Representative Lippert, I'm going to give you. We've got about a minute and a half left. I'm going to give you that last minute and a half. You can either respond to Representative McDonald 
or you could talk about the clean car question that I uh, asked uh, 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 Senator I'll, Rarick. I'll do it's both very here. quickly. I mean, I think it's, it's difficult to uh, compare a selective private school to uh, a public school. I, I think those are, it's not a apples to apples comparison. Related to electric vehicles, I think um, the ball is definitely rolling downhill on uh, uh, more renewable energies with utilities and uh, electric vehicles too. And that's exactly what we need to do to address the climate crisis. Um, 2035, I believe, is when GM is going to have an all-electric fleet. They'll have, uh, by 2025, they'll have uh, electric vehicles across their fleet. Hummer has a, a truck that has an um, electric truck out that with 1,000 horsepower. I mean, the, the performance here is, um, you know, pretty, it's, that performance is ridiculous. Um, but I think we'll find that the performance of electric vehicles is, is what we need. We need to be building infrastructure out. Um, across the state and um, allowing people who will want to purchase these vehicles the opportunity to do so. All right, I'm going to thank our panel this evening. I want to uh, express my appreciation to you, the viewers, who called in with some great questions. We had some great dialogue and exchange of ideas here. That's what this program is all about. The program belongs to you. We invite you to call in with your questions for our upcoming programs, and we'll see that those questions get stored and sent to um, our new panel next week and the weeks that follow as we look into the public policy issues that face the citizens of the state of Minnesota. Again, thanks to the panel. Thanks to the viewers. We look forward to seeing you next week and all the weeks that follow until the legislature goes home. Thank you and good night. There's much more about your legislators online at pioneer.org slash your legislators. Find out more about the history of the program, who has been a guest, and watch past episodes and discussions by topic. To continue the conversation, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. From developing best practices that help farmers better protect our natural resources to the latest innovations in corn-based plastics, Minnesota corn farmers are proud to invest in third-party research leading to a more sustainable future for our local communities. Additional support by Minnesota Farmers Union, standing for agriculture, working for farmers on the web at mfu.org.